So this is going to be a little interactive at the end. I might ask for three volunteers. So I just hope that you guys will um, help me participate. Yeah. So um, what I'm going to speak about is the spoken word of God. How many of us know that the word of God is living? Yes. It's breathing. Yes. It has power, right, to, to bring life, right? Yes. And it can also cause death to anything contrary to his word. Right. Once spoken, this word will go out and accomplish what is, this, what is, what is set out to accomplish. Amen. If we can look at Genesis 1, first I just want to go there really quick. Just put this in perspective, right? So in Genesis 1, thank you, Lord. It says, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and God said, let there be light. Yeah. Right. So that's the word. It was a spoken word. Right. right. Who was that light? Who, who, who was the light? All right. Let's just confirm that. Let's go to John 8, 12. Let's confirm the word. So in John 8. Verses 12, he said, it says, then Jesus spake unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. Amen. He that follow me shall not walk in darkness, but should have the light of life. So we've established that like, Jesus is the light of the world, right? Okay. So now, once we understand how powerful the word of God we can then understand how that word can transform us. The Bible provides us with clear and concise instances and examples of how powerful the word of God is. Looking at Genesis, he said, let there be light. And at that time, there were, that word, there was an activation. There was a manifestation of that very word. So let's go to Isaiah 5, chapter 5, 10 through 14. Um, 10 through 14, when the church get it, let them say amen. amen. All right, I'm almost there. <laughs> the <laughs> All right, amen. All right. <laughs> so in this scripture, basically, um, we're looking at it from a spiritual application. And if you guys could please read it from me. It was, Isaiah 55, 10 through 14. 55, I'm sorry. No, no amens. Hold the amens. <laughs> Isaiah 55, chapter 10 through 14. <laughs> All right. Okay. So far as the rain come down and the snow from heaven, it return not thither. But it waters the earth and makes it bring forth and bud that gives the seed and the sower and the bread to the eater. So shall my word go out forth out of my mouth and it will not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and shall a prosperous, a prosper in the things that I send it to. So now if we're looking at the word, it's likened unto seed, right? It, it's a seed, right? right? How many of you are happy that his word goes out and accomplishes all Amen. things that it's set to do? Amen. I thank him for calling me out of darkness into his marvelous light. Yes calling me out of the mouth of the grave into his truth and life. 
We have to preach the good news. We have to declare the word of God. Yes. We have to testify yes. on his goodness. Yes. If not, what's the purpose? Amen. What's the purpose? Amen. We have to speak on the gospel. Sometimes we see ourselves in a distorted light, like kind of like in a filtered way. Right. And don't get me wrong, some filters are nice. <laughs> they kind of give a couple years till you take off some blemishes, <laughs> right? But really, what does filters do? They alter the appearance of an image, right? Who does God say we are? Genesis 1, 27 says that God created us in his own image. We are the image of the living God. Zion, we are who God says we are. Not how we see ourselves, not how others see us. We are children of the most high God. It's time for us to step into that authority. It's time of, to us to stand on the word of God. Thank you, Lord. Why are we sometimes our, ourselves worst critic? Oh, no, I can't do that. Oh, no, that's, that's not my thing. Our father, the one and only true living God, is the master and creator in us. It is him that gives us power. It's not out of our own might. It's not out of our strength. It's by his spirit that we are empowered. So sometimes we got to step out of that thinking. I can't do it. I won't do it. No. You have a, you have a purpose in this place. It's to stand on his word. It's to preach the gospel. It's to send it out. And if you don't do it, you do his kingdom. No justice. No justice. Come out. The, come out. Come out of the comfort zone. Does his spirit not live in each and every one of us? Does it not abide in us? The word is powerful. The word gives creation. God's word is likened unto seed. It creates a spiritual life when you in spiritual death. Because you can be physically living but spiritually dead. That's like a walk-in zombie, you know. The word of God has power to pull us from whatever darkness that we are in. And I don't know if you guys know that darkness can get so deep that alone we cannot see the light. That alone we cannot find our way out. I am grateful that the word of God has power over our lives. And that he loves us so much that he will pull us out the darkness even when we don't deserve it. Praise your name, Lord. The word of God has power to pull down every stronghold. So now this right here is the interactive part. Can I get three volunteers? All right, I got one. Elder Brad? Yes. So this is going to be our, our representation of strongholds. So this is going to be, what this is something that I learned, right? Amen. Hallelujah. So this is us. This is the representation of us. Come on. Come on. No, I need two. I need two. Well, yeah, I need two more. All right. So my question at the end of this is going to be, who's the creator of your stronghold? Right? A stronghold is a fortress. It's, it's, it's something that stands in a, it blocks. Right? It, 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 this is what a stronghold does. Now, who's the creator of yours? So I'm going to ask Elder Brad to stand right here. Come on over, brother. All right, now, this stronghold here, it's a fortress. It's protecting this individual back here, this child of God. Now, if this fortress is built up on the lies of Satan, that fear, mistrust, right? When the word of God comes through, I'm going to pull my hand out. I want y'all to block every hit, okay? When the word of God comes through, <laughs> all right? Come on, light, love, peace, a sound mind. This is the fortress of our adversary you understand what i'm saying yeah. it cannot get through the light can't get through <laughs> the law can't get through to come here come now let's re let's redo this fortress this is the word of god this is the lord made fo fortress right now i'm the adversary lies <laughs> <laughs> Destruction, <laughs> sickness, mm. make that look better. Hate, video. Mm. sadness. Mm. All right. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Lord, got you, bro. If 
we build our fortress on the word of God. Nothing from the enemy can come through. Nothing from the enemy can't come through. Build your, thank you guys. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Lives move quick. Yes. Yes. Praise God. Praise God. In that moment, it shows that even when you think that God don't have your back, He got you because at the right time, God's timing is perfect. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So at first, in my thinking, I was like, oh, Lord, we tearing down all strongholds, every stronghold. But I didn't really research what that word meant. It's a fortress. So if we're going to tear down the fortress of the adversary, we're going to build up the stronghold of our father. We're going to build up the stronghold of our God so that he can protect us through the wilds. It's nothing in our power that we can do. But when we stand on his word, the foundation, the foundation, that's how we prevail. We give glory to God. So I'm going to wrap this up with a prayer. I want y'all to stand in agreement with me. Lord, Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Father. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you are moving in this place, Father God. Lord, we tear down every stronghold that was created by the enemy in this place. Lord, we build up your strong tower, your fortress, so that you may prevail, Father God, so that your love will abide in us. Lord, we give you honor and praise, Lord. Lend your ear to our cry, Father God. We are your children, Lord. We thank you and we love you, Father God. We welcome you into this place in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Praise the Lord, everybody. Is God good? Amen. Hallelujah. How many of us believe today the Messiah is returning soon? Yes, he is. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I believe it. How many believe that we are his chosen elect? Come on, yeah. I believe it. Amen. So, how many of you know that everyone will not enter the kingdom? Amen. So, I want to go ahead and start off here from reading from First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians four. Chapter 4, verses 16 and 17 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Amen. Amen. When the Lord comes back, it's not going to be silent. No. It's not. I'm pretty sure some people have heard, you know, the stories of it happening where it's like a secret catching away. Oh. Right. Been, they, they publicize a lot through media, through books. People made plenty of money off of it to the point where yes. people now are in this mindset. Even cartoons are, are telling people that there's going to just be a uh, whole series of just people just vanishing randomly and you're not going to know why so according to the scripture it says it's going to be a loud cry yep. now i know about you all but we have parents in here and when a baby cries you hear it yeah. you know it yeah. exactly <laughs> and and not not only that though but when you know when you when you hear that loud cry the family members that are also familiar with that sound know it as well and the same way when a sound, you think of a trumpet or a shofar, those aren't quiet. No. Even from we hear large sounds of a trumpet, even the smaller trumpets, just as loud. So it's prevalent that you know that when it comes down to the coming of the Lord, it's not a silent or secret no, thing. First Thessalonians 5, 1 through 4 says, now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, 
you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. This is dress, addressing the body of believers, letting us know that, the Lord, that we know that the Lord is coming back. And if we keep his commandments and keep his words, we won't get caught off guard because we have already been preparing for his coming. We have been preparing for the time of our master to come and return. Verse 3 continue to reads, while people are saying there's a peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape it. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for the day of the surprise, for the day to surprise you like a thief. So we're not ones to just get caught off guard. It, scripture says it right now. We are not the ones to get caught off guard. There will be others that may get deceived, that may get caught off guard, but we are not ones to do that. It says that when it occurs, it's going to be like a, you're, there, there's those that's going to feel a peace and security. Now, we all live in Florida, so we know most of us live here long enough has experienced a Florida hurricane. Amen. And when you have a hurricane come across, there's an eye they call the storm that passes over you. When that eye passes over you, it's a peace. It's a calmness. For some people who don't know, they're like, oh, whew, it's over now. It's gone. But then after it's gone, that eye passes, and all of the wake of that backlash comes in. And that's when some of the heaviest destructions occur. And the strongest winds pick up, and the heaviest of, 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 of the hurricane can attack at that point. But for God's people who've been alert, who've been paying attention, who's been waiting, we won't get caught off guard there same way. Amen. Amen? Amen? Matthew 24, 29 through 31 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven a sign of the Son of Man, and all of the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds, from the one end of the heaven to the other. Again, the, the return of the Messiah is going to be visible to everyone. Right. Yes. Everyone will see him coming. It says, like, when Jesus died on the cross in the scriptures, it says that, the, that the, the, the soldiers at that moment were recognizing, like, wow, this, we messed up. <laughs> you know, when you read the scriptures, they're like, this is the Messiah. At that point, they already, already put him on that cross and nailed him there. But in God's glory, you see, it, in his glory, it is revealed. They see it. They see it at that moment. When the Messiah returns, it's not a matter of, no, everybody will know. Everybody will see. And at that point is when it's going to hit you where, oh, man, I done messed up <laughs> for a lot of people. But for us, thank the Lord, we stay diligent. We keep his word. We keep his word. We keep his commandment. We stay in his word. It's so important because right. without his word, we don't have that guideline. You look at the Bible, you have to understand it. You can't just read New Testament only, right. nor can you only rely on the Old Testament. Right. You have to have all of it combined in one letter right. for you to understand from cover to cover the whole storyline. An individual, you look at certain people when they grow in their life, and there are people who may not have like a solid foundation of their culture and their background, and they'll always question that. You always kind of wonder, even growing up, even when you know some of your family and you find out you meet a cousin and you're like, oh, we've got that part in the side of our family. You want to know and understand more your culture and your background, because when you find out that we are part of royalty, right. that we have royalty in our blood yeah, yeah. and we have that name, hallelujah, that name of royalty applied to our lives, right. there's so much more power in that. Yeah, yeah. There's so much authority in that. Amen. And then when you know on top of that, oh, my Messiah, my Father's coming for me yes. now. You're not alone. 
You're not alone. You will not get cut off guard. Because why? You're expecting. Because you're expecting and you're wanting to know more and learn more. So we stay diligent in this word, knowing that our Messiah is coming. But unfortunately, some people won't notice that until the end. So that's why we have to stay diligent in it. Because through our examples of moving forward through Christ, it's, it's the hope and the prayers that they will see. This is all we can hope for is that they will see. But there is, that there is a difference. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 11, 16 through 19 says, Take care lest your heart be deceived. And you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you. And he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain. And the land will yield no fruit. And you will perish quickly off the good land that the Lord is giving you. You shall therefore lay up, the, lay up these words of mine in your heart, in your soul, and you shall bind them in, as a sign on your hand and shall be as a frontless between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, talking to them when you are sitting in your house and when you are walking by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Just as the enemy has his mark, we talked about this three weeks ago. <laughs> Just as the enemy has his mark, he has his counterfeit. The Lord has marked us, his elect, his people. He's elected uh, and, and marked his children and told us that we need to meditate on his word. We need to stay in his word and train them to our children. Because as, as, as parents, as aunts, as uncles, as brothers, as sisters, the young children they need to understand what that word is yes. so that way they won't be deceived so that they will know who their Messiah is right. so that they can grow up and have the opportunity to be blessed, to be forgiven and to be thankful of a Messiah that they serve. Amen. Ephesians 1, 11 through 14 says, in him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to might be to the praise of his glory in him you also when you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation and believed in him were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of your inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory? 1 Peter 2.9, but you are ch a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Hallelujah. We as believers are his elect. We are his elect. We are his chosen people, a royal priesthood. When we made the decision to take on his name in baptism, his name in baptism, we became his. We accepted him. We, we, in that acceptance, we now are entered into the family. We're now trying to take on his cultures, his tradition, and learn our inheritance, learn our family, learn our ways now. So through that, we observe days that our family and our culture observes. Through that inheritance, we celebrate days that our family and our culture observes. And through those things, we begin to teach our children and they begin to learn the customs and the laws that we abide by as a family. So as we teach those things as a family, then the same as to our children, we begin to teach our children those same customs, the same laws and that culture so they can continue on that line of education. And as they learn those things that's ingrained in them, what have we been doing now? We've been staying alert because our Father's coming. Amen. Our Messiah is coming. Yes. So it doesn't stop here. 
We need to continue to educate our children so they know our Messiah is coming. Our Father is coming. And it continues. It continues. That's the way you carry on the line of the culture and then the inheritance is to pass it down. But not everybody's going to get it. Matthew 24, 24 through 27, it reads, For there will appear false messiahs and false prophets, performing great miracles and amazing things, so as to fool even the chosen, if possible. There I have told you in advance, so if people say to you, listen, here out in the desert, don't go. Or look, he's hidden away in a secret room, don't believe it. For when the Son of Man does come, it will be like lightning and flashes out of the east and fills the sky to the western horizon. Verse 37 continues on and says, For as were as the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered that ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, and one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, and one will be taken and one left. We cannot be fooled for a fake. We cannot. Especially as believers that we read and we know the word. All of us here have sat under great teaching. And it has been implored to us that we have what we need, the book, the yeah. word of God. Yes. We have this Holy Spirit inside of us. Yeah. And we have a direct relationship with the Messiah. Yeah. Yeah. So it is our responsibility and duty to continue to study the word so we do not get deceived. Yeah. We're, in, we're all held accountable. So we can't blame it any longer on my pastor told me. My youth pastor told me, my elder told me, they told me sit here and I should just keep doing the work. They told me to serve here and just keep doing the work. And I heard the word, but they told me that's all I need to know. No, it's not. You have to read it for yourself. You have to study it and show thyself approved. Yes. You can't rely on um, uh, an individual of a man who's trying to give you the word and then say, that's all I need. Because if you don't go home and read it for yourself, that's how you will get deceived. Because when the Messiah comes, you're going to miss it. Yeah. And we don't want to. We have to be in our word. We have to read. We have to study. We have to understand what our culture is, what our history is, and who it is that's coming for us. Yeah. If we don't do those things and rely on somebody to tell us, what if they're missing out? What, what if you only went by, <laughs> as, as Sister Felicia said earlier, what somebody says who you are? We read the word and know who our father says who we are, not what somebody else says who we are. Amen. Amen. I, I, I want to say you look in the scriptures and it says Noah shared the gospel with men. So you want to believe that Noah was there and people are watching him saying, what are you doing? Oh, I'm building an ark. And they're going to question him. And he's going to tell them. And there probably were people that looked and said, for what, rain? It doesn't rain here. What do you, what, what's rain? You know, it, it doesn't rain. So they're looking at him like, what do you, because God told you to do that? They were probably, I'm, I, want to, I want to believe that there were people that were probably like, you know, maybe he's right. I mean, he's been sharing the gospel for us for a long time. But they don't know because they didn't study they I want to say that they did not take the time to build that relationship with God because Noah was the only one in his family because it says Noah shared the gospel they have to receive the gospel the same scripture as everybody says all the time our people perish for the lack of knowledge why because they reject the knowledge given to them our people perish for the lack of knowledge because they reject the knowledge that was given to them. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3 says, Now the Spirit 
<clears throat> the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Though the uncertainty of liars who concise are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received in thanksgivings to those who believe and that know the truth. We're in a time that marriage in the household isn't respected anymore. It's, it's, it's not. And everybody's on this new, on like, not everybody, but people I've come in contact with are on this journey of, well, you know, the church has all of its flaws and these people do all their own things. Who's to say that, you know, this, that I can't be my own God if I just <clears throat> heal myself and think positive thoughts, that I'm my own power, my own empowerment of God? No, because they don't know who they are. They don't know who they belong to. So that deception is what's eaten up at people now. And with a platform of social media, now you have people online that can tell you who you should be and who you think you are. And unfortunately, there's people who will just sit and listen, be submitted to that. Right. Instead of getting into the word and understanding who they are and obtaining that true relationship with their Messiah for themselves. Right. Revelations 13, 11 through 17 says, Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it allowed to work in the presence of of the beast, it deceived those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the, of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all both small and great both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark that is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number of the beast is 666. The same way I was saying before, the Lord has his elect. The enemy has his own counterfeit. He has his own mark that he's going to issue out. You look in verse 11, it says it has horns like a lamb, but it's not the lamb of God. It says that it breathed life into the image, but we know God is the one that breathes breath and gives life. God gave us his mark. He's given us his mark that we take in and hold to us that we apply to our lives and abide and walk in. And through that authority of God's mark, obeying, obeying his law, keeping his commandments, understanding our culture, that is how we stay alert. That is how we stay connected. Not forsaking the fellowship with one another, because as a body and as a family, that's how you grow and you share your culture and you share the knowledge and you build and strengthen one another. Matthew 24, 42 through 44 says, Therefore stay awake, for you do not know what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not let his house be broken into. Therefore you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Yeah, we can't predict the exact, exact date. We just can't. We can have an idea if we understand the culture, if we understand our history. We know, as the story with the ten virgins, the, the five wise, five foolish, that with that story there was some that they all had oil, which means that they all were ready at one point, right? Yeah. 
But then there was five that knew to carry extra. And there was another five that thought they had enough. Because we think that we have enough, we're not ready yet. We need to keep moving. We need to keep pushing and studying for ourselves. So I just want to make sure that we're all, we all know that the Lord is coming back one day for his people. And we need to make sure we stay alert and we stay aware. Because we don't know when it is, but as long as we stay connected as a body, we continue to build our family up and teach our children and meditate on his word, we won't get caught off guard. Amen. 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 Let's ask these questions up front. And then we'll open with the word. How many people heard how to be saved other than baptism growing up in different churches, different denominations? Heard that there was, you could, what, accept the Lord as your personal Savior, right? Okay. Uh, you could say a sinner's prayer, right? You could just go, come up here and cry your eyes out. You could get, con you were confirmed in the Methodist church at 11 or whatever. I got my Bible, it says I was, right? Um, you know, all these different things, you know, they just say, oh, yeah, you, you, you're a member of the church, right? Yeah. Who's heard different things, right? right. Amen? Amen? Almost like it was each denomination's purpose to just make it up. Yeah. Almost like it was not written down somewhere, that it wasn't clear, right? Right? And so then it confuses everybody, yeah. right? Because, well, this denomination says they can just throw some water at me and say I'm saved. This denomination says I can be baptized and then everything after that doesn't matter. Once saved, always saved. Yeah. Except you guys get the idea, right? Can I tell you 100% that is not how the Lord works? That is utter confusion. That is the devil. Just say it straight up. God is not the author of confusion. And he said there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Well, that's definitely included then. Amen? Amen? So today, I'm going to relay to you the gospel of the kingdom. Right. To whom and to what purpose? To whom and to what purpose? The gospel of the kingdom. Can I tell you, even in Pentecost, they get the steps right but beyond that what's the vision what's the purpose what's the why and where are we going what for amen let us stand to uh, uh, read the opening scripture and then you guys can be seated Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 22 Ezekiel chapter 36 Verse 22 through 27. The gospel of the kingdom. You guys are probably like, why is he not flipping to the book of Acts? Because the gospel was foretold long before Peter was ever born. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 22 through 27. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, or Yahweh, 
When through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. The gospel of the kingdom. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 31. At the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 through 34. If you have it, say amen. amen. You don't have to be quiet now just because we've already had two people speak. You guys can. Amen. You can amen. Amen. That was because all the children left. Verse 31, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Someone say new covenant. New covenant. With the house of Israel and the house of Judah and the house of Gentiles. Oh, sorry. With the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Someone say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Both the prophet Jeremiah and Ezekiel spoke or prophesied at a time where uh, Israel and Judah would both been sent away into captivity by then. Amen? They were speaking of a future redemption. God had blessed them and given them His word of what the new covenant was, what the plan that was from the beginning. Even Moses spoke of this. He did. He talked about the circumcision of the heart. Moses did. God reveals His plan to His prophets ahead of time. I'm going to say that again. God revealed His plan to His prophets, His prophets, ahead of time. Amen? Amen? Let us go to Amos chapter 3, verse 7. Let me get this out of the way. Amos chapter 3, verse 7 says, For the Lord God does nothing. Someone say nothing. Nothing. He didn't even send Paul to Rome without a prophet telling him he was going there. Amen. For the Lord God does nothing without revealing His secret to His servants, the prophets. Especially, this is me adding this, especially matters of doctrine and salvation. Lord help us. An example, go to Genesis 18, verse 16. Genesis 18, verse 16. This is leading up to Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham, a friend of God, had just had a divine visitation. Then the men set out from there and they looked down toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to set them on their way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, 
and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Someone say, all the nations, all the nations. shall be blessed in him. <laughs> I didn't say where to stop repeating. Amen. Y'all are great. Praise the Lord. For I have chosen him. What did uh, Brother Gerard said? We're a chosen people. A chosen generation, I believe. Yes. For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Notice the Lord promised Abraham because he knew Abraham would be faithful. There's not many people in the Bible you're going to see God called a friend. <laughs> Abraham, a friend of God. Imagine a friend of God. May we all be found friends of God. Can I say something he said that sparked a, a thought in me? Every one of us, every one of us has to be the first in our family. Every one of us. Somebody's got to be the first. The Abraham, the Gideon, to smash daddy's idol and leave. It ain't easy. Abraham walked. He didn't have a car. He walked from somewhere around Kuwait. And I don't know if geography is anybody's strong suit. But he walked more or less the length of the Euphrates River to modern day Turkey. And then, just as he thought he was getting comfortable, the Lord said, now leave the rest of your brothers and uncles behind and head south through Israel <laughs> down into Egypt. But in every family, there has to be that first person or that first couple that steps out and leaves daddy's idols behind. Amen. It ain't easy. It ain't easy. Paul went into one city and said, the whole city is given to idolatry. Imagine being the one to not be. Oh, yeah, well, when he convinced somebody, you saw what happened. <laughs> it caused a big uproar. Like, oh, ain't getting in our money and our profits with the F-I-T-S profits, right? Money profits. But it's not easy to be the first. Amen. I'm not, I'm not picking on our sister, but she knows. It's not easy, right? It's not easy. So God shared that with Abraham. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1. So we have Amos tells us that God does nothing. Peter doubles down. For those that have been here any length of time, you know these are five of my favorite verses, and that's okay. You'll hear them several more times. It is. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 through 21. Peter speaking. For we did not follow cleverly devised fables or myths. When we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. When? Did Peter go off into the future and see the kingdom? No. He went up a mountain with James and John and Jesus. And they had front row seats to a vision and saw the future glory of the king. Amen? So he's saying... I went up on a mountain, had my face buried in the dirt, peeking out, and saw glory. 
saw the glory to come. That's what he's talking about. I had, I'm eyewitness, front row seats. I was there. I asked him if he wanted a suka. He looked at me like, what are you talking about? But we were eyewitnesses of that majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. So they saw and heard, eyes and ears. Peter's like, we were there. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. Peter's saying, I, ha I was there for the vision. I saw it with my own eyes. But listen to the prophets. He's saying, don't listen to my vision. I mean, that's good. We have a more sure word of prophecy is the way the King James says it. This is a fully confirmed prophetic word. Amen. 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 Peter's saying, I was there on a mountain. I saw this wonderful vision of the future glory. Stick to the prophets. Amen. It's already written there Amen. and confirmed. Amen. Amen. Go. When you look at these, these scriptures about his, his glory... It hasn't been fulfilled yet. Amen. But they saw the fulfillment of it, if that makes sense. Amen. That's, that's wild to me. I've never thought of it like that. It's like it has Abraham, not yet been fulfilled. They've seen the fulfillment of it. Amen. It's like when Abraham uh, said, I saw that city. I looked for that city. It's like when John saw it. Yeah. Amen. The full revelation. And the one he couldn't even write down. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine what that was. But... Peter is saying, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, a more sure word of prophecy to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. In other words, from your own imagination and thoughts. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Ghost or were moved by the Spirit of God. And how do we know? Because anything they prophesy has to line up with the written word or it's not from God. And it has to come to pass. And they have to say obey the commandments. It's two tests of a prophet. One, that it comes to pass. And two, that they direct your worship to Yah and to no one else and to obedience. Amen? So Peter, Amos says that God does nothing without revealing it to his servants, the prophets. Peter says their word is more sure than my vision. Let's go to Acts 2, 36. How many know that the sermon Peter preached was not repent and be baptized. <laughs> How many know he preached a whole sermon about Joel chapter 2? <laughs> and then ends with this sentence for the sake of time. Starting in verse 30, 36, listen to who Peter's talking to. Listen to this. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, or Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. How many know that's all of us here? Has everybody here sinned at least once? Okay. So he, he laid down his life for us too. <laughs> now when they I bet right now when they heard this they were cut to the heart cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles brothers what shall we do and Peter said to them repent 
and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins or the remission of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to Himself. And with many other words He bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. I think the King James says untoward. I don't know what untoward means, but I know what crooked means. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And I think, does it say those who gladly received his word? Yeah. How many know there's something about being glad, <laughs> gladly receiving the word? Don't go kicking and screaming. So I just want to bring something out here. Even in the baptizing part of the church, what are they almost always using to convince you to be baptized? Or even worse. They're just trying to save yourself from hell. You guys know that God is... <laughs> got so, such a much bigger plan than saving us from a pit of fire. He could have done that without our help. Amen? I mean, he did. He's actually trying to build a kingdom in the earth. Amen? Amen. Where we are kings and priests with him. That's harder to do. Now, we all got to get regenerated. We've all got to come to a place of repentance. And I don't know where everybody in here is and, you know, where you're at as far as repentance and baptism. I don't know where everybody's at with it, right? But we all have to get to a place of repentance and being immersed in baptism in His name so that we can see the kingdom and enter it. Amen. He'll fill us with His Spirit. Amen. Amen. But beyond that, then what? Then what? For most people, they're just like, I'm saved from my sins, I'm not going to hell. Or they might even be a little more glass half full about it and say, I got baptized, I'm going to heaven now. Something like that, right? It's still not it. It's still not it. We're going to get back to Ezekiel in a minute. He has to wash us and regenerate us from our fleshly nature so that we can become more spiritual beings. Amen? That can be used for His spiritual kingdom, but that's physically coming to this earth. Who was Peter, or to whom was the gospel preached? Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'm actually almost there, guys. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Okay. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. I think we read a few of these. Brother Gerard. Love it when we've got the same verses in our notes. Peter's telling somebody, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That you may proclaim, now this is kind of what Felicia was saying, right? You can proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I want you to remember the whole darkness thing in a second, okay? Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Who's he talking to? Who have we always been told he was talking to? No, that's not who we were told he was talking to. Gentiles, right? Oh, yeah, Gentiles. They weren't a people. Right? All the Germans, <laughs> Japan, wherever, right? Everybody but Israel. Go to chapter 1, verse 1. Beautiful thing about the Word of God 
It interprets itself. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, his, his bona fides, he's like, I'm an apostle. I'm speaking as an apostle of Jesus Christ. To those who are elect exiles of the, what's your Bible say? Diaspora, dispersion, exile, right? In Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, according to the four, those places sound familiar, right? For on the day of Pentecost, there were devout Jews from every nation, from Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia. <laughs> I was like, here, here's your, here's your letter. Let me give you an update. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling with His blood. Peter's letter is to the Jews, the tribes that have been scattered amongst the nations. That's who he's talking to. He's talking to Israel. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going somewhere. Somebody, somebody might be getting nervous. Like, what is he teaching? Go to Romans 9. Romans chapter 9, verse 24. The gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. Paul writes, starting in verse 24 of chapter 9. Even us whom he has called not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. Or uh, does there say mercy? Those that had not obtained mercy will obtain mercy, maybe. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called the sons of the living God. Someone say amen. 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 So Paul and Peter both quote this prophet. And most of the church world doesn't go back and read the prophet being quoted. And so then, doctrines like a Gentile church get started. Doctrines like, well, we got the new covenant, and the Jews still got Moses or whatever, right? That's how they, that's how some in, in, in certain communities, they'll explain that. Well, they still got that, and we got this. He said, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. He said, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's not an alternative path. In another place it says, those that still do service at the temple don't have right to our table. You can't have both, but yet it says you're one. Right? So if you're still going to the temple doing temple sacrifices, then you're not part of the new covenant. There's not two options. Jesus said, I am the way. Amen. I am the truth and I am the life. He said, no man. He didn't say, no Gentile comes to the Father but my me. He said, no man. That includes Jews. Hallelujah. That includes all 12 tribes. Amen. There is no other way. There is no, well, until they see Jesus, they can still do it the old way. No. They missed the time of their visitation. And Paul said it broke his heart, basically. Paul said he would himself be forsaken if he could save his own countrymen. Right? More or less. Paul was willing to just be like, just take me out, just save them, Lord, like the spirit of Moses had, right? So because we don't, and because we disparage the Old Testament and too much of the modern church, we say you don't need Genesis to Malachi. Well, if you don't go back and read the Old Testament in context, you won't have a clue what Paul nor Peter's talking about right here in what I just read. So let's go there. Let's go to Hosea. Hosea chapter 1.
the more you read the Word, the more you realize a large part of it is about God's love for His people. God's love for His Israel. His love. It's a love story. Ups and downs and heartbreak, but a love story. Starting in verse 2. Context. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of whoredom. You imagine? Do you imagine? Elder? Go over there to that intersection and marry her. That's what he just said, right? I mean, that's... But listen. He said, go take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom. For the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Dibliam, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, call his name Jezreel. For in just a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel. And I will put an end, listen here carefully, and I, this is God speaking, I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. Someone say, put an end. Put an end. God's saying, I've had enough. Put an end to them. And on that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. God was ready to utterly reject Israel, the northern kingdom, the ten tribes, led by the, uh, Ephraim, the son of Joseph. That tribe. She conceived again and bore a daughter, and the Lord said to him, Call her name No Mercy. What's it say in there? It's a lo, lo Ruma. Lo Ruma. Okay. For I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. But notice the Lord makes a distinction right here, and this is key for everybody to hear. But I will have mercy on the house of Judah. He makes a distinction between Israel and Judah. Northern kingdom, southern kingdom. Amen. God says, I will break the bow of Israel. I'm done. Second child, I'm no more having mercy on Israel. I'm done. Judah will always have my mercy. And I will save them by the Lord their God. And I will not save them by bow or by sword or by war or by horses or by horsemen. In other words, it ain't going to be by military might that I'm going to save Judah. But I will continue to have mercy. Moving on. When she had weaned uh, Laruama, or no mercy, she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said, call his name. What's it say there? Loami, which means not my people. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. Right here was the divorce. God says, I'm going to break your kingdom. Mercy is cut off from the house of Israel, and I don't even know you. Now does it make sense what Peter's saying and what Paul's saying when they quote this? Israel had become utterly like a Gentile in the eyes of God. And they had been thoroughly scattered and mixed amongst the nations. They were no longer a standing kingdom. They were a scattered people. Scattered and sifted, it says in another, uh, another place. Sifted amongst the nations. You know when you put dry ingredients in a sifter, at first you can see flour and cinnamon and everything, but when you start turning that thing and it gets thoroughly sifted, can you tell the original ingredients? Come on now. I feel like I might start preaching. I'll finish reading first. No, I'm going to preach right there. This is not about DNA. 
I want to be very clear. I don't know about no replacement theology. The church ain't replaced Israel. Okay? And it ain't about, oh, you got to be able to find some one of the 12 tribes in your blood. I don't know about all that. Here's what I know. If the Word pricks your heart and you repent and get baptized, you're grafted in. Yes. Yes. You become Israel. Yes. You become part of Israel. Let's say it that way. So how do I know who's Israel? I don't know. Why do you think Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the good news of the kingdom? Because guess what? The sheep know his voice. Yeah. So basically, if you come across a son or daughter of Israel or someone like that wonderful Moabitess woman, Ruth, that ended up in the genealogy of the Messiah of Israel, come on now, married into the house of Judah, come on. If that word pricks their heart, guess what? They've utterly then abandoned their former identity and then they identify with Israel of God. So, I don't care if you can find out which one of your great-great-grandparents married someone from the tribe of Naphtali. I don't care. Let's put it this way. The Lord took them down into Egypt. Seventy men. I believe, right? Seventy or 120? Seventy and 120. I want to get my numbers wrong. Under Joseph, or under Jacob. Seventy men. Ha ha. Funny. Seventy nations. Interesting. They went down into Egypt a small people. A family. Farmers. Right? Herdsmen. It says, he brought them out of Egypt. Sorry, G, for me walking around so much. He brought them out of Egypt, a mighty nation. And then under David and under Solomon and all the other kings, they continued to grow. How many millions do you believe were scattered amongst the nations? Across the Euphrates and beyond. Scattered. Thoroughly mixed. Thoroughly vanished into the nations of the earth. Israel ceased to be identifiable. But the Lord knows those that are His. And those that are His know His voice. And those that have a love for the truth will answer the call to repent and to be baptized. Amen? Let us read. For every punishment, I haven't found one yet, for every punishment, God always has a way of escape. Or a redemption. He turns our mourning into joy. Right? Or dancing. Something. I can't remember all the songs. <laughs> Verse 10. Yet, the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea. Now, we got a beach here. Anybody going counting sand grains out there? Stephen, you... You're good, right? Okay. That's a lot of people, which cannot be measured or numbered. Thank God. And in the place, and in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. And the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together, and they shall appoint for themselves one head. Anybody know who that is? And they shall go up from the land for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Guys, the Lord has a beautiful plan. The Lord is finding, seeking. How many know you don't find God? How many know God finds you? 
You know, sometimes we say, you know, I, I started my journey for God. Man, before you even thought about journeying back to some church and trying to get right with God, God was out there looking and putting him on your heart. Amen. That was the Holy Ghost leading you to a place of repentance. How many know the fact that we even get to a point of repentance, the fact that we even get to a point in our heart and our mind, we're like, I got to get on my knees, on my face, and I got to cry out to God and apologize and repent and get right. How many know that's grace? Yeah. That's real grace. That's not greasy grace. That's true grace. Grace is God waited and gave you time to repent instead of just pew, just zap. Right? Yeah, yeah, just, just bat an eyelash like I'm done with that one. Aren't you glad God is more patient than we are? Hello. I'm talking to all the parents out there. I'm talking to all the people in traffic out there. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad God has more patience than we do? Man, this earth would be empty. The animals would be happy. This guy would just be up there like, pew, 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 just like, bam, whoa, where'd they all go? Right? Yeah, amen. She, but she's playing right along. I love this. Okay, guys. Look. We're going to finish, and I hope it's okay with everybody. I'm going to read Ezekiel chapter 36. I'm going to do this for a reason. So many times, for, the lar for most of our life, we never knew what the whole purpose of this whole thing was about. It was just like, woohoo, I'm not going to the lake of fire. Or, woo, I'm going to streets of gold, which both are, never mind, that's another day, right? The kingdom is coming to earth. The meek shall inherit the earth. Yes. Hello. Thank you, Lord. Daniel didn't see. Yeah. I, Daniel saw a rock coming down from heaven. Yeah. He didn't see a bunch of saints floating up to a rock. Talking about the kingdom of God. Right. He saw all the kingdoms from Babylon to Media Persia to Greece to Rome. And then he saw the kingdom of God smash all of those right. on earth. He didn't see them go up to heaven to get kicked out. He saw Jesus come down. Okay. So when it says we meet him in the air, Brother Gerard, and forever be with the Lord, because once we join him, we're with him. Wherever he goes, we go. And guess where he's going? He's going to Zion. He's going to the Mount of Olives. He's going to put his foot down. He's going to turn a dead sea living. He's going to sit on a throne of his father David. He's going to rule in righteousness and justice. Come on. Yeah. You talked about the grain. I think it was you or, or Sister Felicia talked about like the grain, like famine, right? Like the grain. It talks about in another place in Joel about the locust ate this, this grain and that grain, right? Watch this. Let's go to Ezekiel 36. The kingdom of God is about so much more than you. Can I just say this? Americans, it ain't all about you. God loves each and every one of us. And He wants a personal relationship with each and every one of us. But this thing ain't about us. What did He say, Israel? I'm not doing it for your sake. I'm doing it for my holy name I'm doing this. We, He gives us a choice. We can get on board. Or He's doing it anyway. God wants to save you, you personally. But, but I think sometimes in America, we got like an inflated view of ourselves. Amen. So let's just read this and then we'll close. Amen. If you can just bear with me. I want to show you how full. How many know the earth groans? How many know the animals await the manifestation of the sons of the living God? And the restoration of all things. I want you to listen that God cares about. Did you know God cares about mountains and hills? Watch this. God's plans are so much bigger than we thought. Ezekiel chapter 36. And you, son of man, talking to Ezekiel, prophesy to the mountains of Israel and say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God. Because the enemy said of you, Aha! And the ancient heights have become our possession. 
Therefore prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord God, precisely because they made you desolate and crushed you from all sides so that you became the possession of the rest of the nations and you became the talk and evil gossip of the people. Therefore, O mountains of Israel. This is their part of the good news. The mountains have part of the gospel. Therefore, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God to the mountains and the hills, the ravines and the valleys, the desolate wastes and the deserted cities, which have become a prey and a derision to the rest of the nations all around. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, surely I have spoken in my hot jealousy against the rest of the nations and against all of Edom, who gave my land to themselves as a possession. Oh yeah, he's, he's calling names. He's calling cards right here. He's like, Edom thought they were taking some of my stuff. With wholehearted joy and utter contempt that they might make its pasture lands a prey. Therefore prophesy concerning the land of Israel and say to the mountains and the hills, to the ravines and the valleys, thus says Yahweh our God. Behold, I have spoken in my jealous wrath because you have suffered the reproach of the nations. Therefore thus says the Lord God, I swear that the nations that are all around you shall themselves suffer reproach. Now he's talking about when he comes back right there. All the nations that gather against Israel. Verse 8. But you, O mountains of Israel, shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel. You guys, this may sound very familiar in the book of Revelation. It talks about trees and fruit and just abundance, right? Let's keep reading. For they will soon come home. Who's coming home? Hello? Israel. For behold, I am for you. Behold, I am for you, and I will turn to you, and you shall be tilled and sown. Still talking to the land. And I will multiply people on you, the whole house of Israel. All of it. The cities shall be inhabited, and the waste places shall be rebuilt. And I will multiply on you, man and beast. And they shall multiply and be fruitful. And I will cause you to be inhabited as in your former times. And will do more good to you than ever before. That's crazy. Then you will know. I'm in verse, uh, back half of verse 11. Then you will know that I am Yahweh. I will let people walk on you. Even my people, Israel. And they shall possess you. And you shall be their inheritance. How many know there's an inheritance coming with this? You don't, you're not only escaping something, you're inheriting the land. And you shall no longer bereave them of children. Thus says the Lord God, because they say to you, you devour people and you uh, bereave your nation of children. Therefore, you shall no longer devour people and no longer bereave your nation of children, declares the Lord God. And I will not let you hear any more the reproach of the nations. How many know when the kingdom of God comes back, there's not a tongue going to be lifted against Israel? And you shall no longer bear the disgrace of the peoples and no longer cause your nation to stumble, declares the Lord God. Now listen, here we go. Verse 16. I'm almost there. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel lived in their own land, they defiled it, listen, by their ways and their deeds. Their ways before me... <clears throat> We're like, what's the King James say? Uh-huh. Like the uncleanness of a woman and her time. Amen? So I poured out my wrath upon them for the blood that they had shed in the land and for the idols. God cares about that. And for the idols with which they had defiled it. I scattered them. What did I say earlier? I scattered them among the nations and they were dispersed through the countries in accordance with their ways and their deeds. I judged them. But when they came to the nations, wherever they came, they profaned my holy name in that people said of them, these are the people of the Lord and yet they had to go out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations to which they came. Pause for a second. So God has set the backdrop. I scattered you, and when I scattered you, when you got to wherever nation you were going into uh, exile, you continue to profane my name with your idols and your false worship. 
And we already read the next part about how the Lord, from verse 22 to 27, talks about how He will vindicate the holiness of His name. Amen? And that He will give us, in verse 26, a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And He talks about in the verse before how He's going to remove the uncleanness of our idols from us. Amen? In verse 27, And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people. Do <laughs> you hear the prophets echoing each other? Do you hear the prophets getting the same word from the same spirit? Amen? Hosea and Ezekiel and Jeremiah were all on the same page. And Peter and Paul both knew it. <clears throat> And I will be your God, verse 29, and I will deliver you from all your uncleanness and I will summon, listen to this, and I will summon the grain and make it abundant and lay no famine upon you. I will make the fruit of the tree, the increase of the field and the increase of the field abundant that you may never again suffer the disgrace of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways. Wow. After the Lord brings them back, they'll remember their evil ways and your deeds that were not good. And you will loathe yourselves for your iniquities and your abominations. It is not for your sake that I will act, declares the Lord God. Let that be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited and the waste places shall be rebuilt, and the land that was desolate shall be tilled, instead of being the desolation that it was in the sight of all who passed by. And they will say, This land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden. And the waste and desolate and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations that are left all around you shall know that I am am the Lord. I have rebuilt the ruined places and replanted that which was desolate. I am the Lord. I have spoken. I will do it. This is not a fairy tale. This is not a cunningly devised fable. A prophet of the Lord spoke this word. It will surely come to pass. Thus says the Lord God. This also for two days God has had Israel and Judah at arm's length. For two days, they've been forgotten. But on the third day, he will raise them up. He will pull them out. He will surely plant them in the land. They will receive inheritance. Amen? Amen. We. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Isn't it beautiful? He didn't just say, I'm going to give it a shack. He said, I'm going to put you in the land, and it's going to be like the Garden of Eden. The rubble over there, I've been to Europe, I've seen castles that were so worn down, no roof, no nothing, right? He said, no, no, I'm not going to just let you just inhabit some old rundown thing. They're going to be, the walls are going to be built back up, fortified, inhabited. The Lord doesn't do anything by half. He goes above and beyond what Israel will even think they are worthy of. Well, they'll probably think we're not worthy. It kind of says that right there, right? You're going to loathe yourselves, but don't worry. While you're realizing yourself, I'm going to make the earth produce, the trees produce, the, uh, the, the, your womb produce. That's next. Let's finish reading it, and then I'll, I'm done. Thus says, verse 37, thus says the Lord God, this also I will let the house of Israel ask me to do for them, to increase their people like a flock, like the flock for sacrifices, like the flock at Jerusalem during her appointed feasts, so shall the waste cities be filled with flocks of people. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Amen. It's a glorious, man, there's chapters and chapters and chapters that the, the Lord gave to the prophets to foretell of the beautiful kingdom that's coming. This is just one taste, just one small taste of what the Lord has planned for those that love Him and walk according to His commandments and have the faith of Yeshua. Amen? 
He is going to give us an inheritance beyond our wildest imaginations that is fruitful, that's abundant. He will bless the womb of them. Amen. He will fill the land again. And He will rule in righteousness and in justice. Amen. But to be part of the kingdom, to be part of the kingdom, the Lord gets each and every one of us a choice. The choice, he alluded to it, is at the cross. The choice is at the cross. What do we do with the Son of Man? Amen? Amen. Amen.